Well, welcome to our podcast. This is another episode of Stay Classy San Diego, um, sponsored by Max Lux Media. Um, you can find them at maxluxmedia.com and Barn Time um, Productions, barntimemusic.com, with your host being myself, Steve Wire, a freelance reporter. And today we have the pleasure of bringing on Dan Downey. Um, Dan is a candidate for state assembly in District 77, um, and he's running against uh, incumbent Tasha Borna Horvath. Um, Dan is a uh, Point Loma a resident right now. He yep. has a home in Point Loma. Um, he's actually from Boston originally. Um, Dan first came to California as a prospective freshman at Stanford in 1995. Uh, after visiting San Diego periodically, he decided to move to the area full time in 2020 to launch his financial advisory firm, um, Determined Advisors LLC. Before handling his uh, before hanging his own shingle, Dan worked for 16 years as an analyst and investor at several prominent firms, including as a managing director at Charles Schwab from 2013 to 2018. Um, in his spare time, Dan enjoys keeping active, including playing tennis, skiing, biking, and lifting weights at the Point Loma YMCA. So we're really excited to have Dan on today. Um, we um, also extended an invitation to Tasha Borna Horvath, however, she was unable to make it today. So um, we're going to go ahead and um, do this interview. Um, and I want to get right into the issue. So um, first of all, Dan, can you kind of just tell us a bit about how the campaign's going, um, you know, maybe some of the challenges that have come up and sort of where you see yourself at in the race right now in the weeks coming up to the election? Sure. Yeah, thanks. And First of all, thanks for having me, Steve. I really appreciate it. I feel like we're kind of coming full circle because when I threw my hat into the ring in March, I jumped into the race a little bit late. Uh, My opponent was running unopposed. And I remember you were one of the first people to interview me when I I jumped in for the Coast News. And so I think that sort of kicked off my campaign. And now we're getting down to the the final couple of weeks here. So I feel like it's uh, it's only appropriate for us to, uh, to talk again. And so as far as my campaign goes, it's going great. You know, I'm a first time candidate, as you know, and I've got a background in finance and economics. I'm a financial advisor. I've got a long career in finance and didn't really expect to be running. But when I found out that Tasha was running unopposed, I said, I think that I got to throw my hat into the ring. And so we got up to speed really quickly. I, I hired a treasurer, I hired a consultant, I got some volunteers to help out and started making the rounds and meeting people in the community. And I'd say thus far, I'm really happy with, with how it's going. I think we're going to be really competitive in uh, November. Awesome. That's great to hear. So. Um you expressed in our first interview back in, I believe it was March, um, that you fully see yourself as sort of the underdog candidate here. Um, I mean, Tasha's the incumbent. She has experience behind her. She has, you know, she has a lot of endorsements. She has a lot of funding. She has the war chest. So um, kind of sort of how do you how do you strategically plan to to win a race um, when sort of the odds seem stacked against you in that way? Yeah, you know, going into it, I, I didn't know really what to expect. And one of the things I did last year was I started getting involved with the Republican Party uh, during the Recall Newsom campaign. So I started meeting people within the party in San Diego. And I actually took a class about how to run a, a political campaign. And I thought in this election cycle, I might get involved somehow as a volunteer or maybe on staff at a campaign. I, I wasn't really planning on running. But by taking that class, I learned a lot about the, the basics of, of how to run a campaign. And so I knew it would be an uphill battle. But I think one of the big takeaways that I learned from that was that as the candidate, you need obviously to have a strong platform, but you're, you're also building a team. And so that's sort of how I approached it is just one person at a time, finding a treasurer, finding someone to build the website, finding a consultant, and, and knowing it was going to be an uphill battle. And The other thing I learned was that the candidate really needs to spend most of his time talking to voters and raising money. Those are the things that are the basis of a successful campaign. And so that's really what we've we've spent a lot of our time on. And it is it's a it's a challenge to to raise money as somebody who doesn't have the name recognition of uh, an incumbent like like my opponent or even within the Republican Party, we've got great candidates like Brian Marriott, and we've got um, people like uh, Matt Gunderson, who've got a lot of name recognition, and people have probably seen their names on television. Mm-hmm. We, we don't have the luxury of doing that, so we've had to be a little more scrappy, mm-hmm. and we, we like to talk to the media as much as possible, sure. like yourself, and then get out there and talk to voters. And we have raised enough money to do a little bit of advertising, and so we're focusing mostly on texting, we're doing some digital ads and we're doing, you know, door knocking, you know, all the sort of blocking and tackling kind of things. 
Sure. So that's sort of how we're approaching it is that we are the underdog. We're going to have to just try a little harder and maybe be a little more creative about reaching the voters. Absolutely. So I want to give you an opportunity. I mean, I, I introduced you, but for, for people, for as you said, whom re- name recognition may be an issue in this election, um, introduce yourself. Tell us what you're about, um, you know, any any biographical information and, and just sort of like what got you into running for this election? Yeah. You know, as you mentioned, I, I first came to California in the 90s to attend Stanford. And so I've, I've had a, a, an off and on relationship with California and I've lived in different parts of California besides San Diego. I've lived in San Francisco. I lived in Newport Beach, obviously lived in Palo Alto when I was in college. And so I, I love California. And uh, during the pandemic, I decided to to buy a home in Point Loma. And so at that point in time, I decided that I was all in on San Diego. And I said, you know, if I'm going to stay here, it is uh, it is a tough place to start a business. And I thought long and hard before I formed my financial advisory about whether I should stay in California and whether I should maybe move to a state that has lower taxes or, you know, that has a, a friendlier business climate. But I said, you know, the, the quality of life in San Diego is better than anywhere I've lived. And I've, I've lived in a few different places. And so I said, if I'm going to stay here and I'm going to start my business and I'm all in on San Diego, then I want to also try to make a difference and politically because I think there's a something severely out of balance in California when you look at the political situation where we've had the Democrats in control of the governorship since Schwarzenegger for 11 years, since 2011. We've got a two-thirds majority of Democrats in both the state assembly and, and the state senate. And so when you have that kind of one party rule, you're going to end up with solutions that are very tilted towards one political approach. And so I think what we owe it to Californians as a party, as Republicans, is to offer an alternative to to one party rule. And so that's my my main reason for entering the race was to, to offer an alternative to the status quo. And I think when you look around and you see some of the solutions that that have been proposed and and pushed by the Democrats for different issues, whether it's homelessness or the cost of living or taxes, crime, public safety, there are some significant areas for improvement. And so I think we do need to have two healthy parties in in the state for for the state to to function well. And uh, that's that's sort of the driving force behind my my participation in this race. Sure. So. Let's talk a bit about, yeah, let's jump right into the issues. So um, the big thing we talked about last time in our interview was um, cost of living, affordable housing. So these are sort of buzzwords that get thrown around, um, obviously, um, especially in, in this climate, as you said, with a sort of Democrat-dominated state legislature. Um, Republican candidates for office are really pointing towards the rising cost of living, towards the rising cost of housing uh, as sort of this failure by Democratic leadership um, where do you kind of fit in on that conversation? I mean, do you feel like um, obviously these these problems are getting worse? So do you feel like we're headed in the wrong direction as a state? And what are some tangible policy solutions on affordable housing, on cost of living um, that you sort of bring to the table that sets you apart from your opponent? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think it, it, it's almost a question of where do you start? But for example, I would say when you look at the population of California, we're, as a percentage of the entire country, we're losing share in population. So people are voting with their feet. They're leaving the state of California. We actually lost a seat in Congress in the last cycle for that very reason. And why are people leaving California? Well, I would argue that the cost of living is one of the the big drivers of that. And probably also the quality of life is not what it once was. But when you drill down on the cost of living, the most obvious thing that politicians can address is the highest taxes in the country. When we look at the state income tax, people that are earning as little as $50,000 a year are paying 9.3% in state income tax, and that's the highest in the country. You've also got the gas tax, which is 50 cents and change per gallon, which is driving up the cost of a gallon of gas over $6. So those are two obvious ones. And that's we talk a lot about repealing the gas tax. That's a nice place to start. And Governor Newsom and, and the Democrats have done a, a rebate, which is really just a one-time uh, refund of, of the gas tax. But I think when we're talking about people that are 
working class people that are, that drive to and from work every day. They drive their kids to school. They drive to participate in in life, and we're taxing them fifty one cents per gallon to to get where they need to go. I don't think that that is a very progressive policy. That's actually a, a regressive tax, and so that's a, it's a great example of where taxes come in. But there's other things too because. The cost of living, obviously, a big factor is housing. So you mentioned affordable housing, and I think there's a there's a time and place for affordable housing. But one thing I think maybe a lot of people aren't aware of is the the high level of regulation that the state imposes on builders. And you know maybe builders aren't the most sympathetic uh, characters out there, and you know they're up, probably up there with bankers in terms of you know how the public feels about builders. Sure. But when you look at the cost of building a unit. In California, it's over eight hundred thousand dollars on average, yeah. and the a lot of those costs do result from the environmental regulations that have been piled on to the the builders uh, since the nineteen seventies. And so, probably you know we're getting into the weeds a little bit here, but you can go and look at uh, an organization like CEQA, which which imposes regulations and, and regulates the building of houses in California, and look at a, a whole boatload of different regulations that that are put on the builders that drive up the costs and some of them are very well intentioned one that i've i've noticed is there's one requirement on the how stormwater needs to be clean when it flows out to sea and i think that's on the face of it that's important but for the amount of cost that it's adding to to building a home is it really worth it and so I think a lot of these regulations get proposed and they sound good and they get adopted. But when you roll them all up over 50 years, going back to the 1970s, what you end up with is an industry that's very, very overregulated. And the, the builders who, who have spoken to, to some of their, their industry representatives will say it's almost prohibitive in terms of building new housing in certain areas. And, and what a lot of them are doing is just focusing on what they call infill, which is housing within already developed areas. And so they're very restricted and and it makes it almost impossible for for the housing stock to keep up with the demand. So I think looking at both taxes and regulations are are two areas that that I would really be focused on when I go to Sacramento. Absolutely. Are there any like specific from from your conversations with with builders, with developers, um with with people across the state? I mean, are there any specific regulations in mind that you're like I would if elected, I would I'd be repealing this this and this. Yeah. And, and it would be nice if I could go up there and just repeal things, you know, yeah, at, of course at you will. Kind of fiat power, but, <laughs> uh, but yeah. But in terms of your vote and sure. your, your policy position. Yeah. So I think there's another big factor, and, and we're, you know, sitting in Encinitas now, and a lot of people I talk to in Encinitas are concerned with local control. And th- specifically, there's bills like SB9 and SB10 yep. that – Essentially, what SB9 is called the duplex law. So basically, you can build a duplex in an area that's not necessarily zoned for it. And then SB10 allows you to build, I think, up to 10 units on, on a single plot. And so those are things that are kind of being pushed down from the state level that are not necessarily being met with a lot of enthusiasm at the local level because communities like Encinitas, with, in, in my opinion, they've got a point are saying, look, the amount of density that might be appropriate in downtown San Diego is not really what we want in Encinitas. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's one issue is the preservation of local control. So so I'm definitely opposed to, to SB9 and SB10 for that reason. But we do need to find solutions to the lack of housing. And that those are that's one set of solutions that's been proposed and advanced. But I think there's another factor that we could look at, which is not necessarily increasing density, but opening up development in other parts of the state. And one of the, the regulations that I've just learned about recently was there, there is um, CEQA includes a vehicle miles traveled threshold when they're approving new projects. And, and the idea is they don't want people to have long commutes because that adds to the emission, fossil fuel emissions. And so there is a higher hurdle for building housing that's outside of a major metro area, you know, miles and miles away from employment centers. And I think we need to, to rethink that because for a, a variety of reasons, the, the commutes are not necessarily as destructive from a fossil fuel point of view as they once were. You have people that can work remotely. You also have people that 
you know, might not need to travel to an employment center for, for whatever reason. They could be retirees or have just a different, you know, lifestyle than, than a commuter. So I think while that regulation may be well-intentioned, it's, it's, what it's basically doing is pushing most of the developments to the coast, mm. especially in San Diego County, because most of the major highways are, are close to the coast. Sure. And so that, that's one thing when I spoke to the builders that they mentioned is, is look, we really can't build much that's, that's outside of these major population centers and these mm. employment centers. And I said, you know, we, I think we need to think much, much bigger and think about maybe even building entire, entirely new cities outside of the, the existing major metros. If we've got the land and we've got the ability to develop, then, then why not think big? But I think what we're really pursuing is, like a lot of times with the Democrats, they, they kind of get focused on just one solution. And their solution has been to increase density. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't think that is necessarily the only solution. I do, I do think you know, increasing density can help. But I, I don't think it's a one size fits all. Sure. Absolutely. Well, you touched on um, the topic of transit, which I want to get into in a bit. But um, related to that are questions around, you know, the sustainable energy of our state, you know, questions about, um, you know, you're talking about the environmental regulations, but it's also um, people are worried about these projects for a number of reasons. Some of the projects coming to Encinitas, even um, the Goodson Project, the Clark Project, the Maria Village Project. Um, but there's there's one set of concerns over, you know, density, but there's also a set of concerns over, you know, the environmental, uh, you know, over the vehicle miles traveled, over the emissions coming from these projects. So I want to get into a conversation about um, environment, about renewable energy. And um, there was something interesting that came up in our last conversation, which is um, this topic of, you know, what does California's renewable energy future look like? Um, and in that conversation, in our March interview, you mentioned your support for the notion of you know, expanding our usage of nuclear power. And just for this conversation, I wanted to read a couple of quotes, actually, that I just did some research on before our conversation. Um, you know, there's the conversation up where I'm from in San Luis Obispo, uh, which is around closing uh, Diablo Canyon, which uh, supplies power for, I think, around 3 million Californians. Um, and uh, this has been a widely criticized idea in people who actually study nuclear power and people who study renewable energy. Um, I want to read this quote actually from uh, Jacob Barangino, a professor at MIT's Department of Nuclear Science and Engineering. He said that without nuclear power, it will be difficult to meet demand as intensifying weather patterns increasingly strain the grid. He said that the state needs to rely on all kinds of renewable and carbon-free sources, including including nuclear energy, to achieve carbon neutrality by 2045. Given the magnitude of the challenge that we're facing in terms of decarbonizing and mitigating climate change, I would argue that we should use more nuclear power as we should use more solar and wind. Everything that does not emit carbon dioxide should be on the table. And then just one more quote from Kerry Jackson, who's a fellow with the Center for California Reform at the Pacific Research Institute, says that if officials were realists rather than dreamers, narrative shapers, and virtue signalers, they'd be replacing conventional energy sources with nuclear rather than making wind and solar promises they can't keep. Unless they wake up soon to their miscalculations, they're going to cost Californians not years, but decades. So in this conversation around nuclear power, around the future of sustainable energy in California, um, I want you to again weigh in and sort of give your perspective on this issue and sort of um, sort of defend your position on nuclear power to um, voters who are who are interested in this. Yeah, it's a great, great question. And I, I do agree with the, the quotes that you referenced. I think we are at risk of, of really screwing up as a state. And I think one of the things to look at is for a contrast is the the energy policy in Germany versus mm. France, okay. two very advanced, economically advanced countries that are side by side in Europe. And Germany did away with all of its nuclear facilities uh, not too long ago. And France ha- has maintained nuclear in their energy mix. And Germany, much like California, has, has experienced rolling blackouts, where, whereas France has had un, basically uninterrupted electricity throughout that, t- that time period. And so when I look at, uh, again, the, the solution to California's energy problems, I do see a pattern similar to the pattern with housing, where Democrats sort of get on this one track Minds where they're saying, "Oh, we've got to, we've got to go, you know, zero emissions. We've got to go all the way to wind and solar." And instead of looking at it strategically and saying, "Okay, wind and solar are not there yet," I mean, I think 
most experts would agree that we just can't produce enough wind and solar. For, and one of the main reasons for that is the intermittency is because mm-hmm. the sun is only up during the day and yeah. the wind only, only blows, blows so often. So, yeah. every so often. And so in order to fill in those gaps, you do need another you need access to other sources of energy. And I think it's very telling when you look at Governor Newsom's decision to keep Diablo Canyon open. And you can say, you know, maybe he's got his eye on running for president in a couple of years, but it's not going to help his case whether he's running for president or not if we have rolling blackouts in California. And so I think he at least was realistic enough to say, look, we, we need to keep Diablo Canyon on because the alternative is to have rolling blackouts. Sure. And I think it's a great long-term goal to to reduce our fossil fuel emissions. But in the meantime, we need to have un- uninterrupted access to electricity sure. for our industries, for our families, for, for our, our lives. And so I think this is one of those examples where I think that the emperor kind of has no clothes. And there is a, a lot of talk about going fully you know, away from fossil fuels, but there's just, we're just not able to do that in one fell swoop. So where does nuclear come in? Well, nuclear is is very low cost. It it has no emissions. It does have the problem of disposing of the waste, but that can be done safely. And we've, we've figured out how to do that. And so I'd be actually not just in favor of keeping Diablo Canyon open, but I would even look at things like going back and revisiting San Onofre and saying, mm-hmm. are there ways to ret- retrofit San Onofre? And I actually met a guy this past weekend who was a former uh, utility uh, manager in California. And I asked him, I said, what what would it have cost to, to keep San Onofre up to date? And he said, well, it probably would have cost, I think, half a billion dollars. Which sounds like a lot, but building an entirely new nuclear plant, which is very difficult to do, it's, going to cost multiple billions yeah so i think keeping all those options on the table is is smart because the the alternative to filling in those intermittency gaps that that wind and solar have is to use things like natural gas and natural gas is it's cleaner than than coal for for sure but it does create emissions and Mm -hmm. so i think you know we have to look at the full range of options and not get bogged down with making the the perfect the enemy of the good and sure. i think i think the i think nuclear can be can be a good solution for california yeah well i think that it's interesting because the rhetoric i hear often on nuclear energy um is just not based in reality right like you have people talking about how dangerous it is you know how um how costly it is um but you know the experts tell a completely different story um, a story of a very uh, safe form of energy a very low cost form of energy so what are some sort of misconceptions people have you feel like in this state about nuclear power and how would, how would you sort of address that well i think it, it goes back a lot to the the 70s and the original environmentalist movement and of course back then there there were uh, there was three mile island and there was Ch- chernobyl in the 80s and so you've had some some significant problems with nuclear but We've learned a lot since then, and the technology keeps advancing. And so I think th- those those are misconceptions that that nuclear is sort of what it was in the '70s and '80s. There, there's an entirely new generation of technology mm-hmm. that I think we that we've been able to develop that that works very well. And it is it's lower cost. It's um, it's not intermittent. It doesn't create emissions. So yes, you know you have the problem of disposing of the waste. And I think that there's just in a lot of cases there's just a knee-jerk reaction because it's nuclear and be, because of the association, yeah. whether it's an association with past accidents or nu- nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons. I yeah, think those are say. things that are just sort of in the the public mind that create a knee-jerk reaction against it. But I think it's time to take another look at it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I wanted to kind of focus on um, sort of the uh, the transit issue as well, um, tying into what you were talking about before we got onto the sustainable energy topic. Um, now, there's a lot of conversations in San Diego around transit, and specifically, as you know, Sandag recently passed the Regional Transportation Plan, which is aimed at re- you know reducing greenhouse gas emissions by a considerable number. Um, and I think the plan is, um, I'm going to butcher this, 162 billion, 163 billion, something along those lines. Um, sort of this idea that we're going to be investing in, in rail, investing in bus lines, investing in this system of, of mass transit that's going to sort of overhaul San Diego from 
um, you know, everybody taking their cars everywhere and that we're going to get people to actually use and invest in public transit. And I'm curious to know if you have any opinions on the regional transportation plan itself, but also more broadly, um, you know, is this are we going about this the right way? Are these the correct investments or are we sort of missing out on the real future of mass transit? Because you have people pushing back and saying that this is that these are antiquated forms of, of, of transit, you know, that people, you know, some, there's, I've talked to a few city council people um, in the region who have told me, you know, they think the future of San Diego is going to be in self-driving cars. Mm. So, I mean, you know, is this, are these the right ideas? Is, are these the correct kind of investments that we're making? Or what, what does that future of mass transit look like for you? Well, the first thing I'd say as, as someone with a background in finance and economics is when you bring up a number like $160 billion, yeah. we really need to, to look, examine that because a lot of people know about the high-speed rail that was supposed to go from the Bay Area down to Los Angeles. That is something that has gone up in terms of the estimates of how much it's going to cost, and it's already be, been considered kind of a boondoggle. But that was only... I believe, 80 or $90 billion. So we were talking about an investment in San Diego Transit, which is almost twice as much as what they're proposing to spend on the California high-speed rail, which has is expensive to begin with. So I think it, if you take $160 billion and you consider that there's 3.2 million people in San Diego County, I think that, that I might... I, somebody can check my math, but I think that's something in the order of fifty thousand dollars per person. Sure, every man, woman, and child would, would have to be responsible for paying in the form of taxes, and they they are proposing to pay it in to pay for it with uh, a mileage tax, and so that's something that's been kicked around at Sandag, but they want to charge you four cents per mile to for every mile that you drive in order to fund this, and that's on top of we're already paying as as I mentioned the highest. Gas state gas tax anywhere in the country, so basically they want to make it prohibitively expensive to to drive a car, and like you said, they've got a vision where they want to push everybody out of their cars and into public transit, and I think people should think long and hard about whether that is the vision that they have for their future, and not to mention the fact that if this passes with the funding that's been proposed, whether it's a mileage tax or some other kind of tax. We're going to be paying for this far, far before we actually reap any of the benefits of it, because this is a project that's going to take decades. So I think it's they're definitely thinking big, and but it, it is it's something that could could radically transform uh, how how the county works and how how people live their lives. And I, I'm just not sure that that is the the right approach. I'm I'm for public transit. In, in some forms, you know, I think we, we definitely need to look at whether what we have is serving the, the people of San Diego County. But my understanding also is that this is part of, as you mentioned, the, the response to reducing fossil fuel emissions that's been mandated by the state. Yep. And so I think Sandag's response would be that, well, this is what we have to do in order to meet the, those, those, emission goals. Yep. those emissions goals, uh, which is a larger question of, OK, well, are those the right goals as well? Because I think when I look at the bigger issue of fossil fuel emissions, California seems to is definitely on the leading edge in a lot of ways. And I think you could say nobody's done more to reduce their their fossil fuel footprint than Californians. When you look at you know the the electric cars and the emission standards that we've implemented, but on the other hand, what is the goal? Are, are we trying to reach the goals of the, the Paris Climate Accords, which were to reduce the 2% Celsius increase in, in global temperatures? I mean, a lot of scientists have said that we're not going to hit those goals. And, and if we really were serious about it, then we would need countries like China and India to, to fully sort of get participate. That, yeah. I think California accounts for something like 1% of global fossil fuel emissions. So I, I see it as sort of a, a strategy that doesn't really have a, an, an endpoint because we're, we're saying, well, we want to be on the leading edge of this and we, we want to do this because it's the right thing to do. But is it going to actually solve the problem of global warming? Mm. And, and in the meantime, we're, we're committing ourselves to hundreds of billions of dollars of expenditures, which are making it it's we already have a cost of living problem. We know we know yeah. that, so we're we're making it potentially unlivable for for a lot of working people to be able to uh, 
to to live in San Diego County. So I, I, when you look at a price tag that that that's that high, I think we just need to stop pretending that that we can afford ev- everything that mm-hmm. that we would like to do in an ideal world. And so it, I would suggest that Sandag should find ways to reach these goals for for less money, or they they can just say that we're going to scale down the the size of the project but i think it's a it seems to me that to be a non-starter and now as a as a member of the state assembly that's not necessarily my bailiwick to to get involved with sandag but i think that these huge projects i think the california high-speed rail is one that that would fall under you know the auspices of of the state assembly and so I think we just need to really question some of these things. And I think that's where maybe the lack of balance in Sacramento comes into play, where you have a, a majority of Democrats that that are fully on board with some of these solutions almost at any cost. And I think we need I think it's at the at any cost that that we need to start thinking more carefully about. Sure. Well, I want to just briefly touch on the point you made. You mentioned high speed rail, like as as you said, you know, you'll be on the state assembly if elected. Um, are there any tangible policy solutions when it comes to transit that you specifically support? Um, and I'm also curious, and so that's like the first part. And then the second part is just uh, back to our first question about sort of the future of, of mass transit in California. You know, like, are we moving towards um, this kind of self-driving car future? You know, are we uh, moving, are we sort of moving in t- away from people owning their own cars? Are we moving towards um, a, a different system of public transportation, uh, maybe similar to what um, other major metropolitan cities have around the world um, in our big cities? Um, but just back to the first part is just, uh, what are the, the tangible policy solutions that you think you can get behind right now? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I think w- one of the things, um, you know, th- the leadership of Sandag has mentioned is, you know, aside from this, the the mileage tax is that for for this all to work economically, they're also probably going to have to charge for access to the freeways. So you're you're talking about essentially making driving like a, a luxury product, mm-hmm. um, and so I think that there are limited solutions in terms of public transit. But I think just taking a step back, I think we need to think about. What are the needs of San Diegans as opposed to what it seems to be driving this project, which is a, a global approach to reducing fossil fuel emissions? So it's, it's almost a, a, a radical solution to, to a climate change problem as opposed to looking at, OK, could we add, you know, a train line from point A to point B that we expect, you know, is going to have this much ridership? It doesn't seem to me that it seems to me that the goals are, are much larger than actually helping people get to work and, and mm-hmm. to to live their daily lives. And so I, I would be for looking at more limited solutions like that. Um, but I think, you know, the other thing to, to maybe mention is, you know, we've also got from the state this recent bill that was passed that's phasing out uh, gasoline powered vehicles by 2035. Yeah. I think that's also very interesting to think about because if the goal of some of these projects is to to reduce commute time and to reduce the amount of time people are spending in their vehicles, then how does that fit into the expectation that we're going to have mostly electric vehicles by 2035? I mean, mm-hmm. shouldn't it be less of an issue if the vehicles are not emiss- emitting fossil fuels? Mm-hmm. So that's where I think a lot of these goals maybe haven't all been thought through completely. It's sort of like a conflicting vision. Yeah, it is a conflicting vision. And you mentioned self-driving cars, and, and I think that there is a, a real place for the the market to step in and say, hey, you know, we've got self potentially self-driving cars. We've definitely got electric vehicles that should all be in the mix instead of uh, sort of a one size fits all project, which is, is very ambitious, but, but maybe, maybe a little too ambitious. Sure. Absolutely. Um, I, I want to move on um, because there's a lot to get to. I, I think uh, we'd be remiss here if we didn't circle back to affordable housing a bit. And specifically uh, when it comes to, you know, our unhoused crisis that we have in California, I mean, there's sort of two different camps um, that we like to talk about, which is, you know, people who believe that this is a crisis of affordable housing and people who believe that, you know, this is mainly an issue driven by underlying factors, substance abuse, uh, mental illness. 
Um, now, in our last conversation, um, you mentioned all those things, and you sort of talked through some of the ideas that you thought you could get behind when it comes to addressing homelessness at the state level. Um, one thing that you mentioned is that um, you really feel as though the state should be doing more investment into court-ordered diversion programs for those who are mentally ill, those who suffer from substance abuse. Um, you also talked about your support for Governor Gavin Newsom's Care Court Initiative um, for the mentally ill as well. So um, it seems to me as though you sort of fall into that camp that says, you know, let's look at these more underlying factors um, driving homelessness. This is not just about affordable housing. So yeah. is that kind of a correct assessment of your views? And can you sort of elaborate on those um, those ideas and those proposals that you are that you think you can get behind? Yeah, I would agree with that. I would say I think cost of living and, and housing – does play a factor in, in homelessness. Yeah. But I would say, from my point of view, it's it's not the dominant factor. Sure. And we talked before the interview today a little bit about uh, the fentanyl crisis. You know, I think the, there are statistics that show that fentanyl is now the leading killer of, of adults in the United States under 45, mm -hmm. I, I believe. And so there, it's getting a lot more attention. And there are other drugs as well that, that I've been reading about. Another one which we, which we talked about earlier was uh, methamphetamine. And so, you know, maybe a lot of people that are watching the podcast have seen Breaking Bad and that, you know, maybe know about meth from, from that, show. but it was a great yeah. show. And one of the things I, I was reading recently was that about five years ago, uh, the, the Mexican cartels kind of came up with a new process for, for cooking up meth, which they call it P2P. Um, but it uses essentially more hardcore industrial chemicals. And what they've found is that it is linked to, to causing schizophrenia in people that are using it habitually. And so just wow. from what we see, you know, in our daily lives with our own eyes, I mean, we've, I'm sure we've all seen the, the tent cities and people in downtown San Diego or other parts of the county that are apparently having sort of a mental break, you know, with reality. And it differs from, from my experience of what I have seen with the homeless population even you know five or ten years ago. It seems to be getting worse. And so when you read about things like P2P meth, and I, I've even read about the strength of marijuana. They, uh, there was an article recently about uh, Scripps Hospital uh, treating a significant number of people in the, in the teens to 20s per day of people that were having marijuana-related psychosis. And that has to do with the the, the intensity of some of the um, the, the new forms of, of cannabis that, that are being consumed, and so I think when you you add it all up every year, that you know technology gets better, but the technology is also brought to bear on making drugs yeah. stronger. And so I think when you see the the homeless population that's that's clearly having mental health issues that that are mostly. It's hard to say how much they're related to, to drugs, but they're, it's definitely a factor. Then I think something like what Governor Newsom proposed with the care courts, it makes a lot of sense. Sure. Can you kind of explain what that is just for? Yeah. So this is something that I, I think has a lot of potential if it's done correctly. But I, th I think his approach is to say, look, these people that are experiencing homelessness and they're on the street and whether they have mental health issues or drug addiction or both – it's not helping anyone to send them through the criminal justice system and, and into prison because you're really not rehabilitating them. And so, and I, I think most people look at it and say, look, we, we want to help these people. They're sure. clearly having trouble and maybe they're not able to help themselves. But if they commit a crime, you know, if they're, you know, using drugs in public or they are committing robbery or assault or whatever it is, mm -hmm. then they pose a risk to, to the rest of society, and they should be able to access care. And I think that's the, the point of the care court is that instead of being sent to, to jail, that they would have the opportunity to uh, access mental health and addiction services. Now, I think that probably the fatal flaw in this is that it's voluntary, mm -hmm. and so it would be up to the, the person that's you know receiving the, you know, the sentence to to decide. I think the problem's gotten so big that we probably need to make things like this mandatory. Mm -hmm. I mean, if people are committing crimes, then they, they need to be off the street. And if yeah. they're if they're going to be off the street, then I, I think we, instead of pursuing a 
the policy of housing first, which we've spent billions of dollars on. And for those who don't know, this is a the dominant approach to homelessness in Sacramento, which is to say that the goal is to put people into permanent housing, not a shelter. They're, they're supposed to be able to access permanent housing with no requirement to be sober. And as we mentioned earlier, the average cost of, of building a unit of housing in California is on the order of $800,000. So it's, it's a very expensive program. We've already sunk a lot of money into it. And I don't think it solves some of the underlying issues that we talked about, which is, which is mental health and, and drug addiction. So I think there's a pot of money out there that's been pushed into housing first that we could access and, and, and divert that into providing inpatient care for some of these people that are, you know, number one, committing crime because we want to get them off the street, but we also want to make sure that they are able to, to rehabilitate themselves. And so I think that's an area that, that we could take a, take a strong look at, at, at a different approach. Sure. So <clears throat> one, one thing that comes up in this conversation is this idea of voluntary versus involuntary treatment. And it's pretty controversial because you have, um, I think everyone agrees, you know, these people need help. They need some kind of help. But the question is, like, should care be voluntary? And you mentioned that in cases where people commit crimes, you feel like the, the response to that should be, um, in some cases, a form of involuntary treatment. And so I just want to ask you to sort of defend um, your position there. And I'm also curious, like, there's this conversation that I've had um, with a number of homelessness experts who talk about this idea of conservatorships. And, um, you know, this whole question of, you know, should we be making conservatorships? Should we be, kind of be bringing that back to the forefront of the conversation, conserving people um, even against their will as, as part of our solution to those who are too mentally ill to care for themselves or, or too addicted to care for themselves? So I just sort of want you to um, expand on this dialogue of voluntary versus involuntary treatment. Yeah, no, I think the key is ta we're talking about people who have committed crimes. And I think it's it's very well documented. I think um, the DA, Summer Stefan, has put out some statistics to this effect that people that, that are homelessness are committing crimes at a much, much, you know, multiple times rate of people who are who are not homeless. And it makes sense when you consider if, if people are addicted to drugs, they, they can be funding their, their drug addiction through through theft. And, the, and it happens a lot. So in my mind, the, the involuntary treatment should be as a response to somebody who's entered the criminal justice system for having committed a crime. Mm -hmm. And then the other question is, how many of these crimes are, are, are really kind of being ignored? You know, are we really enforcing the, the, the laws as they exist? I, I think the state of California is going to have to decide wh whether we really want to deal with this problem or not. And, and I think up to this point in time, we've basically said we're, we're not dealing with it and it's, it's continued to get worse. And so I, I see, you know, just walking around San Diego, I see people openly using drugs all the time. And that, I think that's one example where you could say, okay, look, I, you know, I don't have kids personally, but I don't, if I did have kids, I wouldn't want to live in a neighborhood where I expect to see people openly using drugs on a regular basis. I don't want to live in a neighborhood where people people are pitching tents, you know, in public spaces and preventing, you know, yeah. preventing me from from using Balboa Park or, or whatever it is. Bill Walton is a great example. I'm sure you saw this recently where he called up yep. Mayor Todd Gloria and said, look, I was assaulted when I, while I was riding my bike in Balboa Park. Bill Walton is, a, a, a you know, I, I love the guy. I was a Boston Celtics fan growing up, but he's basically an old hippie, you know, and, and, he, and he, even he is saying, look, this has gone way too far. Mm -hmm. And so Bill Walton has a right to ride his bike in Balboa Park without being assaulted. And so yeah. I think when I say the state of California has to decide whether, whether we're going to deal with this or not, we're, we're going to have to, I think, show some tough love and say, OK, look, you did something wrong. You, you committed a crime. We're going to enforce the laws that are on the books because that's impacting the safety of everybody else. But we're not just going to throw you in jail. We're going to make sure that you get the treatment that you need. And, you know, the sad fact about addiction is that a lot of people don't seek help and they, and they don't want help, at least in the early stages of their addiction. Sure. And so I think that's what the, what we're going to have to confront as a state is that we do have a lot of people out there that, and, and I, I do separate the, the people that are living a lifestyle by choice from people that are homeless, you know, basically because they, 
they lost their job or they had, mm-hmm. you know, they, I would I would say that they're sort of transitionally homeless. Yeah, there, there there's there's always going to be transitionally homeless people, but I think the statistics would show that those people tend to get back on their feet. They maybe they stay with you know a relative or you know they find a new job, and then they find find a home. But we do have it, it seems to me a, a large population in California and the West Coast in general of long term homeless that that are experiencing a lot of these 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 thorny problems. But I, I think that the state of California can address this if if we show the determination to do so. And I think it's like a lot of things, you know, I think we can do it better than anybody, but we've got to decide whether we want to do it or not. So it ultimately kind of comes down to this assessment of, okay, like there's this large segment of the population that's simply not going to get help on their own. So do we put them in a situation where when someone commits a crime, we say, look, like you can, you can do the jail time, you can, you know, be sentenced or you can do treatment. And we sort of give them that, um, that sort of yes or no option, that sort of binary. That's that's sort of the approach that you seem to be proposing is that we sort of um, leave it in their hands, but we make it very clear that, you know, we will be enforcing these laws and um, it's up to you whether you want to do the time or whether you want to do treatment. I think it probably needs to be even a little more, you know, I'd say strict than that. I, I think... Um, I think a lot of these people maybe aren't in in the position to to make rational decisions, and so I think that's where where we could give um, the judge some leeway to determine mm-hmm. you know what's most appropriate for for each situation. Yeah. Um, but you know I think what we can't do is just you know continue to not enforce laws and and to to let people live in in um, an environment which is not good for them and it's not good for the people around them. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to kind of move to uh, a separate topic, which, well, it's related, but this idea of public safety in California um, is something that we got into a lot in our last conversation. And there's been statistics bandied about in our previous uh, podcasts about crime. Uh, for instance, in Encinitas, um, you know, there's statistics showing that crime rose and there's other statistics that seem to suggest that crime might be declining sli- slightly. But it seems to me as though the latest numbers I've looked at for the major metropolitan areas, you know, LA, San Francisco, San Diego, seems to suggest that in many cases these numbers are on the rise. And so I want to talk about public safety and I want to know like what sort of unique perspective or set of ideas do you bring to the table when it comes to at the state level, how do we sort of address this in our cities? Yeah, I think there's been uh, at least a couple propositions that have passed in the, the last several years that have probably led to what we're seeing now. And as someone who studied economics, I, I am a strong believer in incentives. And I, I, I think that is what determines most people's behavior. If, the, if you have an incentive to behave one way, whether it's a monetary incentive or, or a punishment incentive, then that's going to affect your behavior. And so when we pass propositions like Prop 45 or 47 and yeah, 47, 57, that, that, you know, just as some background, uh, Prop 47 essentially t- turned certain felonies into misdemeanors, so it, it, it reduced the penalty for theft up to, I believe it was $950. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of people connected that to a, you know, the string of robberies, and, and you, you see it a lot in San Francisco, you know, retail, yeah. basically people they going... People just walk in with cartloads of, of groceries. Yeah, and, yeah, people going into a retail store and, and supposedly Walgreens closed all their locations, although I saw Walgreens open and went out last time I was in San Francisco. But long story short, it, it just made it easier to to steal up to $950 and, you know, basically go unpunished. And I think the police were not, you know, really enforcing the law anymore. So that's that's one example, and then fifty seven basically makes it easier to um, get out on parole. So it's another case of making it you know that was basically intended to reduce prison overcrowding, but the the message that it sends is okay we're the state is soft on crime, and so we're reducing the penalties, we're making it you know less of a deterrent, and so I think that that seems to have a direct effect on criminal behavior because I think criminals aren't aren't dumb they they know like hey if I, if it's easier for me to get away with something then then they're going to do more crime and so I think you th- those are two prime examples of things which I think we need to to reconsider 
what we're doing in Sacramento, even if it's well-intentioned, we're saying we don't want overcrowded prisons. Okay, well, maybe there's another way to solve that problem mm-hmm. instead of sending the message that we're soft on crime. Sure. And I think, you know, even during the pandemic, you know, there were examples of letting prisoners out early because they didn't want people spreading COVID within the prisons. And so I think there's just sort of been a general trend. And and even you, you saw it at the national level um, with some of the, the policies having to do with, um, with, with imprisonment. Mm-hmm. And so I think we probably need to go back to a place where we have healthy deterrence against crime. And I think, you know, I think the economy plays into it as well. You know, I think in a tough economy, you're going to see more crime. But, you know, I think we need to maintain public safety. And so if we have the experience, you know, and not, not even, to not even mention, you know, the defund the police movement. So so take all, all those things that have happened in the last 10 years, and I think you add it all up, and the criminal is saying, okay, yeah, I'm more, I'm more likely than not to get away with whatever crime, you know, it is that I am pursuing. Yeah. So I, I think that's where, you know, Sacramento needs to show some leadership and say, okay, this hasn't been working very well. And, and our prime, you know, responsibility to our constituents is to maintain their safety. Sure. And so when we've got policies that have clearly, clearly not been working, then we need to think about repealing them or amending them. So you would report repealing 4757? Yeah, th- yeah, those are two things I think w- would be on, on the um, top of my list. And I'm curious, like, as, you know, if elected again at the assembly level, um, is there anything else that you feel like you could accomplish on that front? Now, one one thing that um, I sort of want to le- loop in here, too, when you have a minute, is um, this conversation that we had in our March interview about border security. Because for you, that was a huge point of public emphasis, of, of emphasis when it comes to, to public safety. Um, specifically for us here in San Diego. So um, I want to talk about that, but I just want to see like what are what are some of the solutions at the state assembly level that you you think you could push for um, feasibly? Yeah, and, it, and it's interesting how how little it comes up, especially in San Diego politics mm-hmm. when you talk about border security. But I think part of it is we actually do a, a relatively good job, and we have fewer problems in places like Texas, or, where I think a lot of the, the illegal crossings are happening. But clearly, you know, under the Biden administration, we've seen a, a huge increase in, in illegal crossings. And so I, I'm just, in, you know, philosophically a believer in, in strong borders, and I think that we just always need to know who's coming into the country, and and, and we need to know that we're letting the right people in, that it's going to be safe for, for the people that live here. Um, so what, what can the state of California really do as far as that goes? Well, I think that the concerns with border crossings have to do uh, clearly with cartel activity. That's a, you know, a big one. And we know that Tijuana is one of the, the most dangerous places in the world yeah. in terms of crime. Um, and so you can we're, a lot of the drugs that are coming into the country are coming from south of the border. They're coming the fentanyl and the and the meth, which which we described earlier. And so I think funding for um, you know drug interdiction is, is a big one. You know that whatever we can do to to beef up security, uh, whether it's uh, drug trafficking or human trafficking, the the crimes that are that are committed that uh, you know across border are things that we can take a, a law enforcement approach to. Uh, we have the National Guard. You know, that's something that, that has not been discussed much. But I, I hear um, Carrie Lake in Arizona talking about it. She's run, running for governor there. And it's something that's been done in Texas is to utilize the National Guard in cases where, where you know, federal, the federal government is not enforcing border security. So that's, that's something to think about. And then uh, there's also a stretch. Um, there is a lot of fencing along the San Diego Mexico border, but there is a stretch out past Ote Mesa, which which is uncompleted in terms of fencing. So I think that's something we could do in terms of infrastructure to to add an element of security. But um, yeah, it's, it's surprising it doesn't come up more. But I think it's something that that we need to really think about. And you know, we've been we've decided that we're a sanctuary state, and so. We're we're not, you know, we're we're basically saying that we're not enforcing uh, 
the, the laws of the federal government. So we're not going to cooperate in the enforcement of, of federal law uh, to prevent illegal border crossings. And, I, you know, I don't – obviously I don't agree with that. I don't think that, that is in the best interests of, of public safety – um, so that's that's another thing. You know, if I was, you know, if I ruled the world, I, you know, I I would be opposed to that. But you know, I think there there are common sense things we can do. Like I, I think fencing is something that that's that's not, so you know, um, doesn't have to be a political issue. And I think um, you know, beefing up uh, security in terms of uh, preventing human and drug trafficking is is another thing. Sure, absolutely. Um, I, I want to move on because we're we're beginning to get low on time. But sure, um, something that's come up in the race between um, Matt Gunderson and, and Catherine Blakespear for state senate, and I don't know if it's been as much an issue for the seventy-seven race, um, but it's it's a statewide issue and it's a, it's a national issue. After the Dobbs decision, um, you know, to sort of overturn the precedent of Roe versus Wade, uh, we're having renewed conversations about um, abortion legality across the country. Um, in California, um, you know, it seems fairly unlikely that um, abortion is likely to um, be prohibited anytime soon um, due to the, the politics of the state. But um, a lot of people are, you know, concerned, um, especially on the left, about the issue of abortion rights and reproductive freedom. And um, Proposition 1, uh, which would has come into play, which would codify, um, you know, the right to abortion in the state constitution. So... Um, I'm just kind of wondering where you're at uh, because in, in the race with, with Gunderson and Blakespear, um, Blakespear has been sort of honing in on this issue, um, zoning in on it and sort of saying, you know, this is the defining reason why you should vote for me because, you know, my opponent um, is not um, mm-hmm. pro-choice, which, which he denies. He says he is pro-choice. But sort of this back and forth rhetoric that's going on right now in the state over the abortion issue, I kind of want to know, like, where, where you come into play on that and what – what your thoughts are specifically on Prop One, but also sort of about this dialogue, this renewed dialogue now that we're having about um, the future of abortion in, in our state. Yeah, that's it's a great question. I think where I'd like to start is I think uh, Blake Spear has really mischaracterized Matt Anderson's views, and and I I know Matt fairly well, and where Matt draws the line on abortion um, is late term abortions. Okay. And so for her to say that she's the only pro-choice candidate in that race, I, I think is just a lie. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, I guess it depends on on wh- how you define pro-choice and can you have abortion up to the, you know, the, the, the day of birth or, or whatever. But I think Matt is occupying a, a space in that debate that m- I think 70 plus percent of people agree with is that, OK, you can have access to abortion up until the final trimester. And mm-hmm. I think that that's a pretty reasonable middle ground for him to, to occupy. You know, from my point of view, I think that makes a lot of sense. I, I, um, I looked into this actually because proposition one is something I, I am not going to support. And it's, it's very interesting because as, as much as I think the Democrats would like abortion to be a live issue this year, and Proposition One is is their attempt to make it a live issue. It really isn't because, as you mentioned, it, it's very very unlikely that the access to abortion in California would change, unless something dramatic happens, like you know, all of a sudden Republicans were in in the governor's mansion and controlling the yeah. state assembly, and, and even it's a total reversal of what we're seeing. Now. Right, it's not going to happen with the, with Newsom or you know his successor or two thirds majority in in both houses, but. When you look at um, the state constitution, and this was something that was brought to my attention recently, there actually is already protection for abortion in the state constitution of California, because there, unlike the, the U.S. constitution, there is a right to privacy that that was written into the California state constitution. And I might be wrong on the year, but in 1982, I believe a member of the California Supreme Court made a determination that that right to privacy specifically does include the ability to to obtain an abortion. And that that was the, what was the flaw in Roe Ro v. Wade was that the right to abortion was based on the right to privacy, but neither abortion nor privacy was, is in the U.S. Constitution. So there is actually already within the California Constitution a, a pretty specific protection for, for abortion. So from my point of view, Proposition 1 is, is purely symbolic. It, it does not really do anything except create a political issue where there is none. Mm-hmm. It, w- nothing is likely to change. It, and, you know, 
even if the Republicans controlled the state government, there still is that that right to privacy and that decision from 1982, which which protects the right to abortion in California. And so, personally, I, I'm a practicing Catholic. I, I, you know, I'm not generally in favor of abortion, but I understand that California has settled law. And if that's the the law that ha, that the people of California have decided on, then then that's something that that it's my obligation to to uphold. Sure. Um, I want to move on because we're low on time. Um, the I think we'd be remiss here if we didn't sort of um, contrast this with um, some of the positions offered by the assembly member. I mean, she's been in office for a while now, and I'm just curious when it comes to her record and sort of um, the way she's. I mean, the way she's been running her campaign, the things she said publicly, uh, sort of like, what are your thoughts in terms of her time in office? Like, what what does that reflect to you? And sort of why do you think voters should be considering, um, you know, fresh blood? Yeah. Well, one thing I'll, I'll mention is that I, I've never met my opponent. Yeah. And so what what I've heard about her is she's, she's a nice person. Um, I don't know what her her real world experience is, but before entering office. I think she's been in office for two terms. Um, but what I do know is that she's she's had um, some bills that that I would find uh, pretty controversial. And one of which we, we mentioned uh, in previous discussions was the bill where you can, if you're riding a bicycle and you come up to a stop sign, you can just roll through it and you don't, you don't have to stop. And it was written up in the LA Times as one of the nuttiest bills of the year. I think it was last year. And it was vetoed by Gavin Newsom. And so I think when you're you're pursuing bills like this, and meanwhile we have a, a state of emergency in the city of Carlsbad because there have been so many bicycle deaths, and and yet she apparently is still pursuing this bill, and I, I just think it's it says a lot when we've got eight or nine percent inflation, we've got the highest taxes in the country, we've got a homelessness crisis, we, we've got a, a a border crisis. And she's talking about rolling through stop signs. I think that's just symbolic of the, the types of things that she's working on. On the one hand, it's 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 kind of crazy because it's I think it does it fits into her her larger view of the world, which is that we don't want people in their cars. We want people riding bicycles. We want want to make it easier for them to ride bicycles. And and at the same time, it, it's not very well thought through. And so I think that. When when people are up in Sacramento spending your tax dollars on things like this, and they're they're not even able to convince their own party that because Governor Newsom clearly thought it was it wasn't safe, then then I don't think she's representing the people of San Diego very well. And there was another bill that came up recently. It was another one that that Governor Newsom thankfully vetoed, but she was she voted in support of this, and it was basically to create what they call shooting galleries, but essentially places it would be a test program in certain cities where people could go and and do intravenous drugs under the supervision of medical professionals and the intention is to prevent overdoses but at the same time you know i think you have to recognize that when you're making it easier for people to do drugs you're you're not solving the underlying issue in in a way you're throwing in the towel and you're just saying mm-hmm. well we we can't solve the pro- the homelessness problem so at least we should you know allow them to go to a place where they can do drugs and not maybe not die. And so I, I think that the state deserves a lot better than that. And thankfully, Governor Newsom rejected that. I, I don't think that that's, you know, I, the solution to, to the to this problem. And so those are just two examples of bills that my opponent has voted in favor of. And I think if most people follow, you know, most people don't follow these issues as closely as you and I do. But I think if people were more aware of these things, they might say, yeah, you know what? Th- this doesn't really jibe with with my personal philosophy on, mm-hmm. on how we should be running the state. But I think a lot of these things kind of sneak under the radar. And so I and I think that's been her approach to this race. Like she she has refused to debate me. Uh, as you know, she didn't even respond to the Coast News uh, Q and A. I think she was the only uh, candidate in in that uh, round of interviews that that re- did not respond, and so she's taking the approach of flying under the radar. And so that's one of the reasons I I jumped at the chance to talk to you today because yeah. I think people need to to be aware when they've got someone up in Sacramento that's supposed to be representing them, yet they refuse to be transparent, they refuse to be accessible, and they are pushing bills that I think most people wouldn't agree with. 
sort of a priorities misplacement, you think, like with, with the, the policies that she's like pushing for with these bills and sort of the, the stance that she's taken in this campaign, you feel like her priorities are sort of out of line with the average the average voter. Is that I think it? so. Yeah. I, I mean, obviously, I, th- I probably talk to more Republicans than Democrats, but the people I know, you know, particularly because she's from Encinitas, the people that I've talked to in Encinitas have said that that she's just focused on the wrong things. And, you know, I, I think that she's, you know, I, I as I mentioned, I, I, I've never met her. I, I would love to debate her. Sure. But, you know, ev- from what I can see about you know, from how she's running her campaign, she she is not being transparent. Mm. And so I think that that's problem number one. And problem number two, as you mentioned, is is some of the priorities that, that she's shown in her votes are, are you know, not consistent with, with what I know about the people of San Diego County. Sure. I want to be careful how I wear this because I'm supposed to, um, you know, be journalistic here. But there is a, a lot of feedback I've been getting from um, residents, particularly in Zanitas, um, you know, who, uh, you know, the mayor here, Kathleen Blakespear, who's running for state senate, as we just talked about. Um, and then you have Tasha Borna Horvath with District 77. Um, and both of them, um, in some way or another, have sort of declined debate challenges from their opponents. Um, in Blakespear's case, um, she's declined to debate Gunderson over the um, the, the, the abortion issue. Um, and in her in Borna Horvath's case, it seems as though she's sort of unresponsive. Um, so I'm curious, like, do you sort of feel as though this sort of ties back to that issue of, as you talked about, one party rule with um, sort of Democratic incumbents not being as um, transparent, as accountable because they sort of have this grip on power um, and that, yeah. that kind of creates this this dynamic of where you sort of lose that dialogue, you sort of lose that diversity of conversation. Um, and I'm just curious to hear if you think this is not just sort of an isolated case of you you and Tasha, but more this is like a reflective of that larger pattern of one party rule. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I think if I had raised $600,000 like, like Tasha had at the beginning of the race, then she would feel probably more pressure to debate me because, yeah. because I'd, I would have access to advertising. I'd be able to put, put out my name more, you know, effectively. But as a first-time candidate and as a Republican running in California, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm definitely the underdog. And so I think it's a, it's a strategic approach from Tasha and, and Blake Spear to say, you know what, we're, we're the incumbents, we've, we've got the money, and we don't need to debate these guys, the, you know, because when they come out and debate me, first of all, I'm going to expose, you know, all the things that that we just talked about where they're not representing their constituents well, but they're also giving me more attention than than they want me to have. They they just want me to go away. So mm-hmm. for them, which you have no intention of doing. <laughs> no, exactly. And and I know Matt Gunderson doesn't either, but you know, I think maybe it's it's going to take a couple election cycles to get to a point where we're competitive enough where our opponents have to debate us. Sure. And so that's that's where we're starting from. We're kind of starting from scratch and going directly to the voters and and making our case. But I do no, I, I don't think it's an isolated incident. And I think if they were representing their constituents well, then then they might be a lot more eager to get out there and and toot their own horn, but the both of them have taken the approach of kind of flying under the radar. Sure. Um last question that I have for you before we close is just sort of um, you know, the, the state assembly job, you know, it's, it's a big job. And, um, I think for a lot of people who aren't familiar with you, aren't familiar with your background are probably wondering, you know, um, you know, why you decided on state assembly as opposed to maybe a smaller, more local office, why you sort of went straight for, for state assembly. And I, I'm curious to know, like with your background, um, how do you think you are uniquely prepared for this position and how do you sort of, um, answer that question of, you know, um, in terms of your readiness for, for a state office? Sure, sure. Well, I'll take the first part first. I I was uh, basically approached by the, the Republican Party, and I, I received a, an email about this particular race. And so they they were looking for candidates. And so that was, I was in the right district, and, and there was nobody else running. And and that's why I got in late, because there, there had been another Republican that was going to run, but she ended up dropping out. So... It was sort of the right place at the right time, um, you know, in terms of choosing state assembly versus any other office. And then 
you know, the, the second part of the question, I think, is how, how am I uniquely qualified? And one of the things I say is, you know, there's a lot of Democrats in Sacramento and there's also a lot of lawyers. And so I think when you have a lot of lawyers working on problems, you get a very different approach to things than when you have people with a, a business and fi finance and economics background, which is what I have. And I think, you know, one of the things we didn't really talk all that much about, but it's, it's a big focus of my campaign, is the state budget surplus. And so, you know, we have a $100 billion surplus, which means the state budget was, was $300 billion and they took in four hundred. dollars So there's $100 billion of tax money that they took in last year that they can't even spend. And so to tie that into the taxes, my point is, how can you possibly justify having the highest state taxes of anywhere in the country when you can't even spend the money that, that you're taking in. And so that, I believe, is a unique perspective that I bring as somebody that's my whole background has been looking at the numbers and, and analyzing them and making decisions. And so I think as opposed to somebody, not necessarily my opponent, but people up there that have more of a law background and more of a traditional politician's background, I think that's one area where I could go, go up to Sacramento and right off the bat can, could add to the conversation. Absolutely. Anything you want to circle back to before we close? Anything that wasn't touched on? No, I think on? we covered a lot. You we know, I, I think this is a, this is a great opportunity. Yeah, yeah. I, I wish uh, my opponent was here to yeah. uh, to debate me. And, you know, maybe, uh, you know, there's still a couple of weeks left, so maybe she'll have a change of heart. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I just I want to make sure that the people in District 77 know, um, you know, that my – my goal is to be the most accessible and transparent state assembly member that, that they've ever elected. And, um, you know, those are people as, as I'm sure, you know, you're, you're going to mention, uh, are, you know, the district includes everything from Carlsbad down to Coronado. So that's it's pretty much a coastal district. And so that's, uh, that's who I'm here to represent. And, um, you know, I intend to do it in a way that uh, is is very responsive to, to to my constituents. Absolutely. Well, thanks so much for coming on, Dan. We really appreciate you, and of course, we appreciate our partners at Max Lux Media for for sponsoring and Barn Time Productions. And you can visit them at barntimemusic.com. This has been another episode of our podcast, and stay tuned until next time. And you stay classy, San Diego. <laughs>